Like Ron said, like everyone said, it's a Saturday, and I appreciate you guys coming out. You're trying to get better at your craft. That's what this professor is all about. It's about developing relationships. And the one thing I'll stick out has been mentioned too, the state of Michigan might be the biggest hotbed for strength and conditioning coaches in the country. And I'm biased, I'm from the state, I work in the state, but when you look around the room at just some of the people we've had in here today, it's pretty unbelievable. Reach out. If anyone's ever a jerk, you let us know, we'll kick them out of the state, we'll send them to Ohio. We're not scared. Easy now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Easy. But, but it is a great state. You reach out to Blair, you, work, you reach out to Ron, I know he's outside of Michigan, but besides the point, reach out to Jim, reach out to Aaron, reach out to Ken Manny at Michigan State, Red Wake, reach out to those guys, reach out to any one of us at any time. We're always more than willing to help you because that's what grows the profession. So thank you guys for, for, bringing, for coming in today. Ron, thank you because my mother-in-law is in town this weekend, so this day worked out perfect. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Ron, for putting this on. Thank you, Jim, staff. You guys are awesome as always. Presenters have done an awesome job so far, and the sponsors can't say enough about the sponsors. If you need something, go to Don King. I've worked with Don. We do all our business. We send our guys to Don. He does a great job. Advocare, awesome products. If we were, if we were able to send our guys to outside supplement uh, avenues, I would push them to Africa. I know a lot of the people that work over there. It's a legitimate company, a great company. They do things the right way. So thank you, everyone involved. First of all, our mission statement, what do we want to do? We want to provide each player with the most effective and time-efficient strength and conditioning program possible. Why do we have to do that? Because we are strapped for time. As Ron said, we have nine weeks in our off-season training. In-season drags out, but our off-season training is nine weeks long. It's extremely short. We have very limited hours with our players based on football, meeting times, charity events, some of the other things that they have to do. We're cramped for time, just like college coaches are, just like most high school coaches are, we're cramped. So we have a lot to put in in a little amount of time. Mission, num mission number two, what do we want to do? We want to demand great effort. The guys who do not give great effort are typically not your ideal guys. They're not the guys that are going to put in great effort in the film group. They're not going to study their playbook. They're not going to practice hard. They're not going to do the right things outside of the building. They're going to be out late at night. They're not going to take care of themselves like you need them to to be successful on the field. Number three, help develop the Super Bowl champion. It's everyone's goal at our level. Obviously, we have not done it yet. That's one of the ultimate goals. And Aaron pointed out a very good, very good point. If our goal is just to win games, we're all going to be freaking miserable because I've not won enough games ever. I never will. I never have. And I doubt anyone in here will ever get to the point where they've reached enough wins in their career. Now, if we can develop young men, we can develop athletes, professional high school, college, develop them into better people and better athletes who are physically able to play at a, at a higher level and, and the potential for injury decreases. I've done my job. If I can win games on the side, I've double done my job because I still want to win. I'm competitive. I want to beat everyone in here, including Ron. I know we'll, we'll meet you guys this year. So we want to win. That's part of what we want to do. And we always say this, if I'm sitting down with a coach, whatever sport, it's a basketball sport, if it's volleyball, baseball, there are thousands of offensive and defensive philosophies across sports, in particular football. Just like strength and conditioning, just like you guys have seen today, there's a thousand ways to do it. Does it matter one way is better? No. I'll present a little bit of what we do. Does it have to be how you do it? Absolutely not. Everyone's situation is different. Not everyone trains in our facility. Not everyone trains our athletes. Not everyone has Calvin Johnson. I doubt anyone else does. We're fortunate. We're very blessed to have Calvin. Not everyone has Ron's athletes or his facility. His facility is different from ours. His athletes are different from ours. They're all NFL athletes, but that's a different situation. Not everyone's going to train in the same manner. There's a lot of moving parts. Some of the things that we've listed, coaches, agents, front office, other staff members, player attendance, pay periods, we pay the players, we hand out the checks, home equipment deliveries. I was just at Calvin's house last week delivering a piece of equipment. Things like that that take up outside time. Uh, ticket requests, charities, events, family, friends, equipment vendors, supplement vendors, everyone. There's a lot of stuff going on. Leads into what our job description used to be. I lift things up and put them down. It's what the weight coach is. It's what the weight coach always has been. Now, what does it turn into? Everything coach. If you're anything like us in our situation, some of the questions that I just threw out on top of my head, hey, do you have any massage contacts or ART contacts? Will you order this piece of equipment for me, deliver it for me, bring it in, make sure you put it together for me, and don't scratch my walls? Got it. Be there tomorrow. Is there any equipment, that, or is there any supplements that can get me jacked? Can you write up a prescription for my girlfriend? My wife needs a, needs a new diet plan. She needs a lot of protein around 2,000 calories a day. I got it. I got plenty of free time. I'll let them up to write it for your wife who will never follow it. Please. 
I'm not bitter about any of that stuff. <laughs> Things to consider. Now, if you're sitting down, you're going into the meat and potatoes. I'm going to write a program. I'm going to develop a philosophy. I'm going to develop my principles as a strength and conditioning coach. What are the things I'm going to consider? Number one, genetics. I'm sorry, but you can't turn you can't turn a person who's probably five foot one, a buck fifty, into an all pro wide receiver. It's not going to happen. Genetically, it's not going to happen. Now, can you develop that five foot one player into the best that they could possibly? Absolutely, absolutely. There's a time and a place, and everyone's built differently. Our offensive linemen are genetically built very differently than our defensive backs. Everyone has a spot. We can develop them to the maximum potential that they have. Injury history. This is a big one for us especially. And I know college, you guys deal with the same things too. In high school, start to trickle down a little bit more. Our guys, every guy's injured. It's 100% injury sport, and I'll get into that a little bit later. But every guy is dealing with something, so we have to be willing and able to work around that. Training history. Very unique to us at our level. We've had guys experience a ton of different training, training protocols and philosophies through high school, through college, through combine training. So we get them towards the end of their career where they've already been exposed to several different philosophies. That's what's inter interesting to us because I even talked to Ron earlier. I can learn almost as much from our players as I hope that they learn from me. I can learn from guys who've been around the country, have trained in a multitude of different philosophies, and they've experienced some different things. And maybe some things work better for them just from personal experience, and some things don't. I can pick that guy's brain and I can detail a philosophy and a program around that player based on what he needs. Years of service, obviously I'm going to train a 12 to 13 year vet differently than I'm going to train one of our rookies. There's just there's a natural age and progression through the NFL. If you played in the NFL for 13 years, you are beat up. <laughs> Jeff Backus did not look like a young man. Just retired. 13 years in the league will age you. It will change the way that you can train, the way that you're able to train. We're still going to need to train to help that athlete play at the highest level. We're going to train a little bit differently. Overall health, obviously, if you're if you're injured, we're going to have to train and work around some of your injuries. Limitations, as I said, football is a 100% injury sport. There's not one guy on our team that is not injured in some way, shape, or form when that season is in the middle of full swing. Now, off season, we can be a little bit more healthy, and it's amazing. Players feel good. They joke around. They laugh. They're not all miserable because coaches are screaming at them every day, and they're happy. So. Strange how that works. Life in the NFL is life with injuries. It's what we deal with. So that's part of what we have to do. Many of our players, players have had surgeries during the early off seasons when we tell them to schedule them or when, when, our, when our training staff schedules those surgeries. So the rehab protocol and everything is in place and we, we develop a plan so that they can get back as close to our off season training program as possible so hopefully they can go through without limitations. When they have limitations, we work on <coughs> Training history, bless you. Now, there's a number of athletes, and I put Kinkalicious up there. This is a guy that has less than one year of, of football experience in his career, and he's in the NFL right now. Now, we had Jason Hansen, who just retired. He had been playing in the NFL alone for 21 years. That's a big gap. This guy has, has not had a significant training history like most of our guys who follow the natural progression. Now, he trains his butt off, extremely hardworking individual, but we have to go back to the basics with Kinkalicious. We, we have to boil it down to a very, very raw program, very basic philosophy, and we're going to build him up through some basic exercises. He's done a great job, and he's already seen some progression, some strength gains, which is huge for him, so he buys in. Now, the interesting thing about the training, the combine training and everything else, everyone does it different. That's when, that's when training history comes into play. Goals of the program, obviously we want to get bigger, we want to get stronger, we want to get faster, we want to develop more quickness, explosiveness, injury resistance, Nutrition and rest is a big part of it. Now, is that a goal? Yeah, it's a goal for me to get our guys to eat right and to rest properly. Because if they don't, they're not going to be able to respond from the training as good as they would have been if they do those things right. And don't take it for granted our guys still don't do that for the, for the most part. Now, maybe some of them do, yes. But the majority of them are still 22 to 25-year-old kids with a lot of money. They don't do the things that we would expect them to do as professional athletes all the time. I don't fault them for it. It's just progression. Some are better than others. Some are worse than others. That's part of what we have to deal with. Our ultimate goal is to get into great football shape. Specificity. We're not a weightlifting team. I like to joke, though. I, I always tell our guys, this whole football thing keeps getting in the way of our weightlifting team. <laughs> they laugh. Put in the bottom line, we're a football team. We're there to win football games. Otherwise, none of us have a job. So specificity of training comes in extremely important. Now, why do we look for qualities displayed by those players? Number one, those players have a higher tolerance for pain and discomfort. I put Calvin Johnson up there. 
It's one of the toughest people I've ever been around in my entire life. I doubt I will be one tougher. Calvin doesn't just play through injuries, he plays through pretty significant injuries. Now Calvin is one of the toughest players that I've ever been around. He's also one of the first guys in the weight room every single day. He's the guy that we need to pull back, otherwise he'll go kill himself in the weight room. He's that guy. He's the guy we all dream about training. He's that guy. So when you have guys like that, you see him return from injury faster. They experience fewer injuries. Even if he's playing through injuries, everyone is, he will still play through it. He'll have better eating habits. Calvin's going to hire a chef. He's going to be that guy that's in bed when he should be in bed. He's going to be that guy that's taking in the post-workout nutrition that he should be taking in and resting when he should be. He's got a hyperbaric chamber in his house. Not all those guys do those things. Calvin is at the top of his game because he does those things. Would he be good without training, without doing anything? Absolutely. Would he be at the top of his, of his game like he is? Probably not. So that right there is the definition of training hard. How to be successful. Show up every day. This is what we tell our players. Follow the program exactly as we prescribe it. If there's a limitation or something we have to work around, we're going to work around it. Don't worry. There's tons of ways to train. If you have a, a hand in a cast, we're going to work around it. Don't worry. You're still going to train. You're not out of it. We're going to find a way to get around it. Give your best effort every day. Invest in your teammates' training. This is a big one because the level that we're at, these guys are competing with the guy next to them, most likely one of their lifting partners, for a job. They're competing for a lot of money. This guy's family needs to eat. This guy's family needs to eat. You're trying to take my job, I'm trying to take your job. It's a very interesting dynamic, but at the same time, we're all, we're all playing for the same goal. We all want to make the team, we all want to win football games. Have the right mindset, get your mind right. Component, commitment to winning in the offseason. Now, an uh, example player schedule, obviously this is very dumbed down, but a sample schedule, wake up, weigh in. Why weigh in? We want our guys to know where they are, where they should be every day. Breakfast, big one. Still guys miss breakfast. Most of our guys will eat breakfast, not all of them. We offer, we have cafeteria at the facility that allows us to, to somewhat watch what they do and to get them in at least line with eating at the right time. Treatment, rehab, rehab, warm up. It's a workout day, what's your warm up protocol? We tell every guy develop a protocol, hot tub, self-generation, self-myofascial release. If you're doing those things, you're going to extend your career. If they get that, if they understand that, they're more apt to do it. Position work after the workout, meet with your, meet with your position coach. Classroom work, study, on field, depending on the time of year, depending what we can do, what phase we're in. Treatment after that, rehab, lunch, rest. They're done by noon, 1 o'clock, if it's a non-OTA day. That's an early day. Go home, do the right things. Go shopping, enjoy yourself, but get your body back right for the next day. Our program, we divide into five calendar phases, all right? So our yearly program will break down into five phases. Within those phases, there's eight physical components that we'll look through. So first, we'll walk through the calendar. From our last game till the off-season program starts, we're talking January, hopefully, hopefully February, all the way up until mid-April now is when our off-season program starts. What do we look for? Schedule surgeries, schedule vacation time. Don't just rest physically. You're physically beat up, you're mentally exhausted. The football season, if you start from training camp just to the end of the regular season, is about 22 weeks long. That's a long season. To be physically beat up and to be mentally beat up, that's extremely stressful on your body, on your family, on your home life. All those things fall on the line, so get away, get back to your family, remember your wife's name, do all those things, and try to get to know them again. Go see your kids. Don't gain any weight. This is a big one, especially for our big guys. Now, some of them follow it more closely. Some don't. Don't gain a pound. I don't want to see a big guy gain a pound during this, this particular phase of the offseason. Exercise should be recreational. Fun, what does that mean? Go outside and play basketball. Those guys that live in southern Florida and it's still 75, 80 degrees during this time of year, go out and play football. Go play golf, but walk. Don't ride. Recreational activity, fun. Strictly monitor your eating habits. This is a big one because it's tough for some of those guys once they get outside the building. The discipline drops a little bit because they don't have someone watching them at all times. So we'll check up on them. We can call them, we can contact them whenever we want. We can make sure they're doing the right thing. If they need help, we can set them up with an RD at their area, wherever they are, or we can we can set up a plan for them. Weigh in weekly, we tell them to stretch daily. If you're not stretching at this particular time time of the year, it's gonna it's gonna come back and bite you a little bit later. Phase two, off season program. So this is where we are right now. Mid-April, so April 15th, April 16th, whatever Monday that was is when we started. Players have to commit to being there. It's not mandatory. We can't make it mandatory because of the collective bargaining agreement. Our players do not have to be here. Try selling your players to come back to Detroit when they all live in Miami, Arizona, L.A., 
Try to tell them, come on back to Detroit. The weather's awesome. Wait, no, it's snowing tomorrow. Okay, just so you know. Now, what do we want to do? We want to train with intensity and volume. We want to set a base during this time of year to set them up to be successful for OTAs. Our first OTA will start this Tuesday. Now, we've been training for five weeks. The goal of that training is to get them ready for OTAs, to get them ready so that they don't have soft tissue injuries, so that they can get through a, a practice with no issues, so that they can practice at full speed for an hour and a half to two hours with our coaches on the field. That's the goal of this. What are some of the physical components that are key? Nutrition, muscular fitness, condition, flexibility during this time. It changes as the calendar goes. There's certain times of the calendar that are more important, clearly. Now once mini camp and OTAs hit, going through training camp, which is going to start in mid to late July, some of the other things that we'll do is identify areas of importance. How do we do this? We sit down with a position coach typically weekly, sometimes daily. If they have a high need guy, we talk to the head coach, the coordinator, front office, or GM, everyone else, anyone who has a concern. We identify those areas of importance because this is the time we have to address them. We can't wait till training camp. When training camp hits, it's go time. 100 miles an hour, let's go. We're going to practice every day, and then we're playing a football game in about 11, 12 days, our first preseason game. So if we do not address them, we miss the boat, and we screw it up as coaches. That's bad coaching if we miss it at that point. Get as strong as possible during this time. We're still going to push the weight. OTAs are physically demanding, but the one thing that saves us, we don't have to use pads. We can't use pads. We can still train incredibly hard, and we can make strength gains during this time of year. That's the goal. I, I hate to hear maintain, we're in maintain phase. We're never in maintain phase, we're trying to get stronger. Why? Like Ron said about the SEC and the NFL, okay, we play the Bears, now we have the Packers, now we have the Patriots. Every week's your top week. You better show up every week, so we're going to continue to get stronger every week. Identify assign training camp report weeks, so this is something we do during this time. It's something we'll talk to the player about. If it's a high needs player, obviously we're going to have to get them on, on a schedule going to have to get them comfortable with the weight we want them at. Sometimes coaches' weight, weight uh, barrier is unrealistic. So we have to find that middle ground where the player's happy, where the coach is happy, where we're happy. Some coaches will come to you and say, well, can he play at 300? Yeah, he could, but he's 330 right now, so he's probably not going to be very good. You have to make the, the realistic assumption that the coach understands physiologically where that player's going to be if you ask him to do something extremely, extremely uh, big, like losing 30 pounds. Hydration comes in extremely important. Weigh in weekly, we're still weighing in. We'll do body count. Now training camp. What's our lifting schedule in training camp? We always try to get at least two upper bodies, one to two lower bodies. Can be a combination of combo, could be a, a total body lift, it could be an upper lower, upper lower. It's going to change by the week. Sometimes training camp, we're going to have to throw a wrench in it, just like uh, Blair said. Every day he comes in and doesn't scrap what you have planned, but you're going to adjust what you have planned. When you throw a training camp on top of it and you have 90 guys in training camp, guys taking contact, hitting each other, running as fast as they possibly can, you're going to have some breakdowns. So there's going to be days where we might have to scrap, might have to do more of a regeneration focused workout while we still get some single leg or stabilization work done on a lower body. That could be a recovery day. That could be a regeneration day. We continue to perform our core exercises, which I'll go over a little later. We're still lifting to get stronger. We're still trying to get stronger. Is it difficult? Absolutely. It's not easy to get stronger during training camp. It's extremely difficult, especially when you're hitting each other. You know, football's a contact sport. It's extremely tough to respond from that. Discipline, eating, and hydration is extremely important during this time. We try to weigh in and out after every practice. We try to weigh in and out after every training session. So our training staff's there, sitting by the scale, weigh in, weigh out, chart it. We have to know where those guys are. That's a red flag if a guy's losing a lot of weight. We need to know that before they come to train. Appropriate rest and recovery is critical. Does it happen? No, probably not. It's training camp. The new CBA did a lot of things, and the one thing that did it forced one day off a week in training camp. That one day is huge. One day is huge. Doesn't seem like a lot, but to force them to get one day of recovery off where they cannot practice, they can't come in. They can come in if they want. It's not mandatory. And we'll do some regeneration stuff. But that one day off a week is huge for our guys. That helps. Phase five, regular season to the end of the season. Now, most important time of the year. Like I said, the phases all have importance. This phase right here, that's what we work for. We're going for phase five. We want to be as big, as strong, as fast as possible, and we want to maintain and build strength for each week. We're going to maintain. We're going to try to gain strength, but I want to at least maintain. Maintain is not the goal. Maintain is the low level. That's the low level. What's the goal? Gain strength. It's extremely hard. 
Every week's different, every game's different. There's some games that are inherently way more physical than other games. Some games, I don't want to say are easy because there's no easy game in the NFL, but some games you come out physically pretty healthy, you can push some weight on those guys after that week. That's one of our goals. Now, during this time, what do we have to do? We have to adapt to limitations, especially during this time of year. Now, this is when the 100% injury fact comes into play. All of our guys are hurt. We'll adjust the workouts. We'll change the exercises. We'll do some single joint stuff. If a guy breaks a hand, breaks a foot, we have no hand routines. We have no foot routines. We have manual resistance options. We have all those different things that we can do to help our guys work around their limitations because everyone has them. Some guys are big limitations. Some guys are small limitations. We're going to have to work around all of them. Weigh in weekly. Friday is our weigh-in day. This time of year, we can assign weights, and we can find guys based around their weight. So if they don't make weight, we can't find them. So now, that weight that we sat down and discussed with the head coach, the coordinator, position coach, and the player becomes increasingly important because if it's an unrealistic weight, that guy's getting hit where it hurts, the pocketbook. So if we keep finding the guy, then we turn to the bad guys. So it's up to us to set that weight realistically way back in the offseason so that we're in a good spot here. Not just for the player's health, for their mental health as well, and for the coach's peace of mind. We need to set something realistic so that we're not battling that all year. Regeneration work must be, must be pushed. Now, it's probably one of the most underutilized aspects of training, in my opinion. Some of the regeneration work that's available, whether it's trigger point therapy stuff, just simple foam rolling, massage work, ART work, all those things have place. They all have a place within strength and conditioning. If you're not doing those things, I don't want to say you're hurting your athletes, but you're not maximizing what they could be able to do. Use your time, do those things. Moving on to the eight components, simple, self-explanatory nutrition, muscular fitness, conditioning, football conditioning, which is different, speed development, skill development, flexibility, rest, recovery. First one we'll go over is nutrition. Why do we want to focus in on nutrition? It goes back to the, to the more disciplined player. What's a player who focuses on nutrition going to have? He's going to have more energy. He's going to have an improved immune and digestive health. He's going to be faster and, and have a more complete recovery after exercise, after practice, after games. Improved body count, which we will test. Weight management, increased strength, better endurance, improved focus. Why do we want all those things? This is going to help them not just training with us. It's going to help them at practice. It's going to help them in meeting rooms. If I have a player who's dozing off because he lacks nutrition, the coach is going to be pissed at the player. The player's going to struggle to, to maintain his spot on the team, all because he probably didn't eat right. That's a shame if that happens. Some of the things we'll do, we'll post stuff. We'll put it into individual guys' lockers. We'll set them up with RDs. We don't have a nutritionist in building, but we have several that we use. We'll post stuff like this, and we'll throw it in the locker. Eat breakfast every day. Eat three meals a day. Never skip meals. Do these things. Invest in your body. When our guys realize when they invest in their body, they make more money, they buy in pretty fast. If you can, if you can describe that to them, they'll buy in. I love that illustration. The guy eats McDonald's, got a bunch of greasy workers in there. The guy who's lived in a dumbbell eating an apple, clean, concise, organized, going to work. That's how your body works. Simple as that. Not all protein and carbs are made the same, high quality. Always go for the more expensive stuff, organic. All the stuff that's available now, if you look at the processed foods that we eat nowadays, Things we're putting into our bodies are not always good, especially when you're looking at the things that our young kids who grow up to be our athletes are consuming from a young age on. This is one of the determining energy need, uh, factors that we use. We'll put a guy's body weight. There's a female factor for it too. Just change the one to 0.9. We'll use this and we'll detail. You need X amount of carbs. You need X amount of protein. This is what you need on a daily basis. Most guys are shocked. Number one, every guy I've ever met with thought that they were eating more calories than they really were. I've had guys say, oh, no, I'm probably eating 5,000. When we actually detailed out and we tracked him and see how many calories they've ingested, I've had guys as low as 1,800 trying to play professional football. They don't realize it a lot of times, so all it is is making them aware. If you can make a guy aware, you're going to make a guy more detailed in his approach. Just making him think about, well, I probably only ate 500 calories in that meal. I probably need to bump it up a little bit. Same thing inverse, inversely, if you have a heavy guy, and he thinks he's only consuming three to 4,000 calories a day, and you can show him, hey, you, you took in six yesterday. That's going to be a wake-up. He's going to start thinking about it. Read the label. He's going to start looking into it a little bit more. Muscular fitness, I think it's important. I think it was Aaron had a couple definitions. I think it's important to have definitions, whether it's strength, power, muscular endurance, whatever you want to define within your program, you should have a definition in mind. What is strength to us? The ability of a muscle or group of muscles to exert force in order to overcome resistance. That's strength to us. Everyone's definition is different. 
I think it's important to have your definition, whatever it is. That no one's right. I mean, well within reason, have your, your definition of strength, power, whatever it is defined. Power to us is time. You're adding in the time factor. So it's applying strength in the least amount of time. Strength is first. Strength is the base. What do we want to do next? We want to develop power so that we can use that strength. And then thirdly, we want to move that power and that strength into football, football specific strength. Muscular endurance, in our opinion, is one of the things that's underdeveloped and underfocused on within football, within sport as a whole. It's the ability of a muscle or group of muscles to sustain repeated contractions. So, once again, strength is the base. What do we do after strength? We build power. What do we do after power? We want to build muscular endurance because if we have strength but we use our strength extremely fast and have nothing left, what good does that do to us if we're playing four quarters? I can play one quarter all out or I can play four quarters. Obviously, four quarters is what we're trying to do. We still recognize genetic potential, as we talked about more. Genetic potential, and I put a picture of our backup quarterback, Sean Hill. He is 100% steroid free. If you see him with his shirt off, you would never question that. <laughs> we call him Hank. Hank Hill is all time. He's one of our hardest workers. But genetically, he doesn't have a body like some of our other guys. He's maximized his body. He's maximized it because he's disciplined in his nutrition. He's disciplined in his training. He's disciplined in all those other things in his life that lead him up to being able to, to maximize his genetic potential. So what do we look for? Body type. What somatic type are you? Obviously we go there, we, we track all that stuff at the combine. When we evaluate guys at the combine, these are some of the things we're looking, looking for. Muscle belly length, leather length, insertion points, neurological efficiency. How do you see that? Give them an eyeball test. You can tell those guys that have that twitch. You can see those guys that have that fast twitch capability. Are there ways to measure? Absolutely. There's tons of ways to measure it, but if you don't have a, a force plate, you can't afford one, there's other ways to, to go about it. Hormone levels. We look at all those things and recognize those as limiting factors to training. Continue. What are our exercises? We're going to use ground-based exercises. We're going to use machines. We're going to use manual resistance. We're going to use everything that works. Almost everything works. Barbells, dumbbells, kettlebells, machines, resistance bands, sandbags, manual resistance, med balls, they all work. If it works and it adds resistance safely, we're going to use it to improve. We want our athletes to improve. That's the ultimate goal. We want our athletes to get better. It doesn't matter if I have zero equipment or if I have the biggest weight room, best weight room in the country. We're going to use whatever's available, and we're going to make our athletes better. Some of our ground-based exercises, deadlift, high pull, power clean, front squat, back squat, vertimax, box jumps, push press jammer, all the things you guys have heard about, we use those things. Now, is there a time and a place? And are some athletes of ours more capable than others of doing some of these lifts? Absolutely. There's some guys who cannot, cannot clean. They can't hand clean, they can't power clean, they can't do a variation of it because a lumbar spine injury, maybe an elbow, maybe a wrist. There's guys that we have to work around and find other ways to go through a hip extension movement where we want to do an explosive or ballistic movement where we can't load them up with a bar. So we hook them to a vertimax. We work some stuff on a shuttle MVP. We do some single leg bounding. We do some other things that incorporate the same thing we're trying to get accomplished with our Olympic movements. Work around it. Every guy's different. Some of our big multi-joint movements are leg press, bench, incline, pull down, row, chin up, all those things. And we do use isolation movements. Just like Ron talked about, there's a time and a place because within football, we're trying to train your anatomy for the game of football. We're not a weightlifting team. So we're not just trying to get to the power clean. Is it a great movement? Absolutely. Is it our stop all? Is that the only thing that we want to do? No. We want to prepare the athlete's body so that they can play football at a high level and stay healthy while they do it. Here's our Olympic progression. First thing, which is the foundation, is the deadlift. And we use the deadlift drop, like Aaron talked about. They use the trap bar. We do use the trap bar. When we get to the barbell, we'll teach a drop out of the top. We work the concentric portion of the movement, and we drop the movement out of the top. We don't go through the eccentric portion of a deadlift with an Olympic bar. Power shirt from the hang position would be the next, and a clean from the hang position would be the next progression. Now, what's our ultimate goal? Our ultimate goal is the uh, technically proficient power clean. So then we're going to go back. We're going to work from the ground. We're going to do a power shrug from the ground. We're going to do a power clean. That's our ultimate goal, a proficient power clean. Do all of our guys get to that point? Absolutely not. Some of our guys stop right here. Some guys stop there. Some guys get to there. Some guys get to there. Some guys come in ready to do that. We have guys that have trained all over the world, all over the country. They've, they've came from all sorts of philosophies and backgrounds. Some of them will never get to that bottom point. Some of them will never get there. And we're not going to force them to do do a movement that's going to sacrifice technique and possibly health just to get them to do a power clean. That doesn't make sense. That's bad coaching. 
everyone's on a different level. We don't force them to get to that bottom level. Is it a great goal? Yeah, absolutely. And some of our guys are extremely efficient at it. Now moving back to strength. Functional football strength is more important than weightlifting strength. Just like I said, but if you take one thing away from this, take that. We're not a weightlifting team, we're a football team. Do we want strength? Absolutely. We need to develop strength because, as I said, it's the base for power, the base for muscular endurance. We need strength. You need raw strength. Without strength, can you have football strength? Absolutely not. Without strength, you don't have anything else. It's the foundation. Intensity, progressive overload, Ron talked about. More weight and or more reps, volume, increased time, decreased rest time. There's ways to progress through it. Rest, typical rest, 90 to 120. Now within that rest period, we're doing regeneration work, we're doing core work, we're doing stability work, we're doing more regen stuff. There's things to do within that while we're resting, but we're not moving. Just like Ron said, I cannot stand athletes standing around. So our guys, when they come in, know they better be moving. they got to be doing something, or we're going to gravitate towards them. We're going to give them stuff to do. It's as easy as that. Limited, no longer in one minute for single sets if we're doing a single set routine, which would tie more to our muscular endurance uh, stage. We're going to have very limited rest time. It might be a single set. It might be a circuit setup. So we're going to have very limited rest time. Power, what's our rep range for power? Three to six reps. Typically, we won't go below three, typically. For certain guys, sometimes we will. Variables to power, explosive <laughs> movements. Some of the movements we already talked about. What's the goal to get to the clean? Can we do it other ways? Absolutely. Can you work the vertimax and develop some explosive power and do some power movements? Absolutely. Will we superset our squad with a box jump or a plyo movement? Absolutely. Plyometrics, what Aaron talked about this morning, we're going to work the stretch reflex. The myotatic reflex, we're going to work it. There's thousands of ways to work. You've got to find what works for you equipment-wise and athlete-wise. Some athletes are not, what, are not prepared and are not capable of doing certain plyometric exercises. So progression becomes increasingly important. Uh, Vertimax training. I, I love the Vertimax. We do use ours a lot. If you can get it, great. If you can't afford it, bands. There's other ways to work around that to attach bands and have spotters standing on the bands. There's other ways to work around that. If you're limited with equipment, don't be limited with your imagination. Use your imagination to open up and figure out ways to work around those and use those pieces of equipment. Endurance, as I said, I do believe is one of the most under-addressed aspects of training, within training. Now, our rep range is going to be typically higher, 12 to 15. Will we do this every workout? Absolutely not. But is it important for our guys to be able to last through four quarters of football? Absolutely. Do we still want to be strong in the fourth quarter? Yep. Do we want to be powerful? Yep. Without a question. Now, are we still going to address muscular fitness with, uh, with uh, importance on endurance? Absolutely. If we don't address endurance, we haven't addressed the entire complex. We're just in strength and power, great. It's great to be strong. It's great to be powerful. Without endurance, are you going to be able to last through an entire football game? So, will we use this every single training session? No. Will we use it once a week, twice a week, depending on time of year? Absolutely, there's a place for this, and we use it. So with circuit training and some of the other things we do will come in. The other thing this does, it lessens the load on a joint. There's a big difference joint-wise on your elbows, your knees. If you're doing a set of three with 90% rep max, compared to doing a set of 12 to 15, whatever movement we're talking about, there's a big, significant difference. Conditioning-wise, phase one, low-intensity aerobic conditioning. So remember phase one, immediately post-season, working up to the off-season. We want to make it fun, recreational. You don't want to go out and run sprints. We don't want them on a football field. We want to play in basketball. We want them swimming. We want them doing an unloaded movement that's joint-friendly, cardiovascular joint-friendly movements. Phase two, aerobic conditioning, moderate intensity. So we're picking up the intensity. We're starting to build into our off-season program. Conditioning is becoming more and more important. As you work into phase two, phase three, aerobic conditioning is at a high intensity, and our intervals are going to pick up, and we're going to chip down on the volume. So we're going short burst, short burst stuff because we're leading into football. We're going into our OTAs. We're leading up into training camp at that time. This time of year becomes one of the most important because it's leading into our most important time of year. So we're going to detail our running and our conditioning to what's conducive to what they're going to be doing on the football field. The most, the most beneficial thing you can do that time of year is have them do the sports specific movements that they're going to do. Have a defensive back and a back pedal flipping their hips, back pedal cut, back pedal break, back pedal flip your hips, sprint. It's important because not just physiologically, they're still getting a conditioning effect and a conditioning stimulus, but they're also working the anatomy that they're going to be asked to work when we get into football practice. If a DB comes up and says, my groin's hurt, well, if I didn't, I didn't back pedal you and break you and get you through your sports specific movements, yeah, you're going to be sore. You're probably not prepared to go out and do those things as fast as possible. So it's important to address those things. 
phase five practice and games. We don't condition a lot within season unless you're a high needs guy. If you're a high needs guy, we're going to do joint friendly cardio after practice. We're not going to run you before practice or anything like that. We're going to pick the time, pick the day, and we're going to work you that way. How do we set up our program? We use a nonlinear approach. Now, there's three stages. As I've said, strength, power, muscular endurance. These are the phases. Three to six reps for power, about eight to ten for strength, and you could even go down to six, six to ten. Local muscular endurance, we're sticking with the 12 and 15. This is one of the things we still feel is under addressed, so we still want to address it. A micro cycle could be as short as one week. So if we're training four times that week, we could use all three stages. We could use two stages. We could use one stage. There's thousands of ways to do it. Each stage will be stressed differently. Specific times of the year, we're going to stress those stages differently. Now, training frequency off-season, we use four-day split routine. We'll do upper, lower, upper, lower. We'll combine that with some total body work, sometimes a total regeneration day, then an upper, lower, vice versa. Two upper, two lower for the most part. In season, we need at least one, one lower on a Monday. Most of the time, early in the year, we'll do a total body. When our athletes are capable of handling a higher workload early in the season, we want to get as much work done as possible while still allowing for recovery. So we'll do a total body early in the year. Sometimes it will go into a lower body training session later in the year. Our Tuesday or Wednesday, which Tuesday is their off day, they can knock out on Wednesday. We can do an upper. So if it's later in the year and they just worked their lower, we'll let them come in and do their upper on Tuesday, Wednesday for the other guys. Lower body on Thursday, that's going to be more conducive to single joint, st stabilization work. We're not going to load them up. We're not going to ask them to do a power workout for the most part on Thursday. We're probably going to address muscular endurance a little bit more and work them through a single joint stabilization type workout with an emphasis on regeneration before and after because we're coming up to Friday, our last practice day of the week. We want them feeling good going into Saturday, Sunday. Three total lifts with an op optional gun show on Friday, so we'll do arms. So if you look at our, our, big, our big overall plan, Weeks one and two, this is our off season. Weeks one and two. So we did mid-April, that takes us through early May. What do we look for? We're working Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. So we're taking Wednesday as our bonus off day. They're still allowed to come to the facilities. We'll have optional work for them. It might be a local boxer that we bring in on Wednesday just to get a non-traditional cardiovascular workout. We'll do a boxing session. Now, you gotta be careful with some of the joint stuff. You have to be careful with the wrist. You better tape an athlete's wrist right because if they break their wrist boxing, probably going to get fired. If I break Calvin's wrist boxing, I'm packing my shit and getting out. <laughs> now, Wednesday is a rest regeneration day for those guys that don't want to do boxing or optional work, whatever we're doing that day. Focus, reestablish strength levels. Why? Because strength's our foundation. We want to reestablish strength levels and begin some form of our power work. We only get two weeks without coaches taking our players and screwing them up. That's all coaches do. They take your players and screw them up. Now, Ron knows what I'm talking about. You get two weeks, that's an extremely short amount of time. Two weeks to get your players ready for on-field work with a position coach. So what becomes more important? That phase that's right before this, phase one, where we send our athletes on their way and we say, okay, this is what I would recommend you do. This is what I would recommend you do in January, February, March, and early April. Those athletes have to be willing to do that because otherwise, nine weeks, in my opinion, probably isn't enough to get them ready for a, for a season of football. So it becomes extremely important what they come into this phase with. So weeks one through two are extremely important, but what they did before that time is probably more important. Our next phase, which we just finished, phase two. We change, we go Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, so we're giving them Friday as a bonus day. As we pick up work on the field, we want to give them more time on the back end so that they rest, recover. Our Friday becomes our rest regeneration day. We're not going to do boxing. We're not going to allow some of that stuff. We'll do some isolation stuff if they need extra work. We'll do some correctives if they need extra work at that point. Most importantly, we'll do a lot of regeneration stuff. We stretch guys. We'll stretch them hands and knees on our hands and knees for hours. We'll take them through trigger point therapy. We'll take them through some of those things that help them recover going into the next week of work. Because what's coming up? OTAs and mini camps. So we're in our phase three right now. It's about to start on Monday. We have four weeks, and we have to get 10 OTAs and a mini camp in. That's a lot of practice in a short period of time. So next week we have three OTAs in a row. We've been training for five weeks. Five weeks to get you prepared for one month of balls to the wall football. That's a lot of football in a short period of time. Now on top of that, we're going to have to change our schedule because we have charity events coming up where guys are asked to do charity functions. They're asked to do these other things while still getting their training in, still going to OTAs and practice. 
this becomes an extremely important time of year because we want to be physically strong to get through practice and to practice at high speed, full speed, get everything they need out of practice with our coaches. But we also want to maintain <coughs> strength gains and build upon our strength gains. We still are trying to create a more powerful and a stronger athlete. If we're not trying to do that, then that's wasted. What if we spend all that time working for it? Stop here? We're going to stop here, and then the players are going home for five weeks and coming back to training camp. That's an important time. Nine weeks is not a lot of time, so we have to use this. Have to use that. OTAs, doesn't matter. We're going to work around it, and our head coach is very supportive of that. That's huge. An example micro cycle. So weeks one through two, remember, we're Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. We're taking on Wednesday. It's our bonus regeneration day. Now, as I talked about, why is it important what they do before they come in on that week one and two? We're jumping right into a strength stage. All right, we're going to an 8 to 10 rep range. You can call it hypertrophy. You can call it whatever you want to. We're doing strength, strength, power, power. We're jumping right into the power. Our players better be ready because we're going right into it. We're treating this as if they've already established a strength base so that we can jump right into our hardcore training and start to build upon strength and power. If they don't come in ready, they're going to fall behind. We're going to detail around them. If they're not ready, we're not going to force them to do anything. But if they come in ready, they're set up for success. Because right when we jump into week three and we start getting closer to football, then we're going to start tying in the whole, the whole scheme. Still working strength, power, muscular endurance, muscular endurance. This is an example. You can split it up any way you want. Obviously, our focus is strength and power. This is early in the off season. We definitely want to focus on strength, and then we want to build upon power. We want to build a base, start to build power on top of the base. Week four, still split, changing the schedule. Remember, from week three, we're going Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, four days in a row. Power, power, strength, strength. Week five, strength, power, muscular endurance, muscular endurance. Once again, why week five? Because we're falling into week six with OTA. So if they're not conditioned to go through a practice, all these things don't mean shit. If you can't make it through a practice, I don't care how powerful you are. The coach is going to be mad at you. He's going to be mad at us. I could have the most powerful athlete, and we have them all the time, who can rep 500 pounds for five times on a bench press, and they're the first ones we cut because they suck at football or they're not conditioned to get through a practice. If you can't service our team and get through practice, you're not going to be there long. Strength, power, then muscular endurance. Overall plan must be in place. So your macro cycle, for us, that's a nine week. That's easy, nine weeks, off season. In season, obviously it's extended out. Nine weeks, what's your focus? For us, it's strength first because that's the base. We want to establish a strength base. Without a strength base, you can't build power. Without a strength base, you can't build muscular endurance. Once again, with football, each stage is important. Power and strength, in our opinion, hold a slight edge over muscular endurance, but we will still stress muscular endurance. They're all three important to us, just like the time and the calendar. The season is the most important part. Strength and power to us are slightly more important than muscular endurance, which we will still address. Circuit training is a great option, and this is something we'll use in our training camp. So instead of a guy coming in and, and us forcing them, hey, we got four by five, whatever we're doing for that day, if we want to address muscular endurance, we're going to set up a circuit. We're going to have each player go through once, twice, whatever it is for that day. Limits the amount of time of rest. Limits it. <coughs> makes it more efficient because they get off their feet. They're allowed to get more recovery. And the coaches can pull them aside and they can meet with them. If you think you're strapped for time in the offseason, you wait till training camp when you're there for 19, 20 hours, but you still barely see the players for an hour. It's a limited amount of time. So that's when circuit training can allow us to focus on guys, still get them good work, but also focus on the high needs guys, maybe with limitations, so we can work around things with them. Non, uh, all the way back. Flexible, not linear. Now this becomes even more important for the season. The only thing that we're going to add into, we still have a macro cycle, we still have everything. Now within that macro cycle, which could be a month long, it could be our whole nine-month macro cycle for our off-season, or it could be our, our mini macro cycles within the off or within the season. This is going to allow us to choose based on each level's uh, physical preparedness for that day. Now, what does that mean? If I took Calvin Johnson and I wanted to figure out how prepared he was, not just physically, but also psychologically, <coughs> mentally, I can have him go through a simple vertical jump test, get him warmed up, obviously. Now, if I know Calvin's jump is normally 42 inches and he jumps 35, he's probably under-recovered and he's not ready for a power workout. So if I have a macro cycle and I know within a one-month phase that I want five power workouts, five strength workouts, and four uh, muscular endurance workouts, 
I can choose one of these muscular endurance workouts on that day because I know he's under recovery. In the grand scheme of things, we're still going to get all that work done at the end of the month. The order in which we, we get it done is going to be based off each level's physical preparedness. Now there's more in-depth ways to do this. There's tons of training, there's tons of tracking softwares, there's things like RestWise, there's sleep softwares where they will actually give you a percentage. This athlete is 77% recovered. This athlete is 80% recovered. And they will track them based on their sleep patterns, based on how much REM sleep they got, based on how they physically feel, and based on how they perform. So we can use that, throw it into our program, and say, okay, he's ready for this or he's ready for that. He's ready for a power workout. He's ready for a strength workout. He might not be ready for a muscular endurance workout because we want to get that power going when he's ready. This might be week one, it might be week two, week three, week four. These are some of the things that if you're limited with equipment where you can test physical preparedness of each athlete. So that's an interesting way to do it. Med ball toss could be a kneeling med ball throw. Could be an overhead throw. Ratings test, it's a simple scoring system. Develop 10 questions. How do you feel? How was your sleep? How was your rest? Some of those tracking softwares use that on top of their tracking software. So those are interesting ways to use a flexible nonlinear approach. Now, is it ideal? It's ideal if you're dealing with small athletes. Like most of us, we deal with teams. It's hard to do because you have to take the time to test those guys. So will we do this with everyone? No. We'll do it with certain high needs guys. We can do this with practice squad guys. We can experiment with some of our, our, our lesser guys. Football conditioning, obviously, it's a combination of everything. So our, our nine-week program includes aerobic interval, includes change of direction, skill pattern running, which, what does that mean? It means our DB backpedaling, covering somebody, flipping his hips. Why do we do that? Because they need to get prepared to do that for mini camps, for OTAs, for training camp, for practice. We're going to combine all those things into one. Specificity of conditioning. Get your athletes moving through what they need to do for their position. Variables to speed development. One of the things we always hear is speed kills. More appropriate way to say that is football speed skills. And everyone hears it. Okay, DB just ran a 4-3. Can't he cover a guy? No, he can't even backpedal. Well, then his speed that kills just killed him because he doesn't have a job. Football speed kills the other guy. Variable speed development, get in great shape, strengthen your muscles used to run, your hips, the lower extremities, maximize flexibility, eliminate excess body fat. Don't be fat. You're probably not going to be as fast as you possibly can. Refine running techniques. Obviously, technique comes into play. And practice running fast. It's the only way to get faster. Practice running fast. Skill development, there's three variables. There's positive, neutral, and negative. Adding resistance to a skill makes it a new skill. That's why if you're doing a sled drag and you're, you're using 90% of your body weight, you just turn that into an exercise. All right? You're not training running. You're not training your guy to be faster. You just turn that into an exercise. Is it a good exercise? Yeah, it's going to kick their butt. It's going to make them sweat. But it's a new exercise. Don't think that it's a running skill or helping them get faster. Adding up resistance to a skill and it becomes exercise like that. Football skills must be practiced as close to game-like conditions as possible. The best way to practice in full pads at full speed, running like you're about to tackle somebody or hit them. Can we do it every day? No. We can't do it because of our collective bargaining agreement, and we can't do it because it's not smart. If we did that every day, we wouldn't have a team left to play football. You can't pad them up and have them hit every day. Contact. Flexibility. Activity progression. Standard progression. What are we going to do? We're going to warm up. We're always going to do our self mild fascial release before we stretch. We want to get the fascial layer smoothed out. We want to hit a trigger point. If the athlete has a specific trigger point, or two, or three, or four, we're going to hit those before we stretch. Keep getting them warm. We're going to move into our active or dynamic warm-up. We're going to perform whatever activity, whether it's practice, training, game, whatever it is. We're going to cool down. We're going to do more self, self mild fascial release, more soft tissue work, then we're going to stretch. Stretch all major muscle groups. Don't bounce. Stretch every day. Implications, obviously, increase the speed and all those things that we've already talked about. Types of stretching, there's tons of types of stretching. PNF, AIS. Uh, if, if you take time and read up on some of those, they're all great and each athlete responds differently to them. Rest, rest between lifting exercises, as I said, is less than a minute if it's a muscular endurance workout, we're focused on that stage. Up to three minutes if it's a power workout, we want to make sure they're recovered and they have enough rest to give us 100% on that exercise. Between training a specific muscle group, 48 to 72 hours, why? Because we have to keep training to prevent deconditioning. Rest between intervals, two to three times the running time. If I ran, it was a 10 second rep, I need 30 seconds off, 20 to 30. Simple. Rest between interval runs, 48 to 72 hours. Once again, deconditioning, try to prevent it. Rest between aerobic conditioning, at least a day. Try to give them a day, just give them a rest. Rest while sleeping, seven to nine hours. Seven hours probably isn't enough for most athletes. 
Regeneration, like I said, probably one of the most underutilized aspects of training. If you guys haven't looked up trigger point therapy, if you haven't looked up some of those things, take your time, get to know how to use a foam roller, get to know how to use a trigger point kit. That's something you can give an athlete and they can take it home and do it on themselves. You can give yourself self-massage all day. It's going to help you guys. They're going to feel better and it's instant feedback. They feel it. Once they feel it, they buy into it. There's a lot of tools available. You've got to figure out what ones work for you because each one works differently. Every athlete's going to respond differently. Each tool has a place. Use them. If an athlete's sporadic with it, they're going to get submaximal results just like training. If they don't show up to every lift, they're not going to be as strong as they possibly can. What's some of our evaluation body count? We track body count weekly now. We have a thing called the in-body. We have a bod pod. We like the bod pod. It takes a couple minutes. And to us, a couple minutes might not sound like a long time, but when there's two strength coaches to 90 players, every athlete that it takes three minutes, that's a long time, but we don't have that time. So the in-bodies, uh, scale that you stand on, you stand on sensors, you hold on to sensors, you use six high and low frequency waves. It's much more than your old bas your, your bathroom scale. It's a little more high tech. It better be a cost enough money. But if you stand on it, it'll give you a readout in less than a minute. So it's extremely time efficient for us, which is huge. But we can teach guys to do it to themselves. The 300 yard show is what we use for our conditioning. I think Aaron said he did too. I'm sure a couple other people have been exposed to it. The breakdown for that's right there are times. For wide outs or running backs, 55 seconds on the first rep, 57 on the second. We run to the 25 and back. There's other teams that go to the 50 and back. It's up to you. We like more turns, more changes of direction just because we're jerks and want to make them work a little harder. But there's our times. You normally don't have a problem meeting the times. Putting it all together, what's the most important thing? Head coach is supportive of the program. If the head coach is supportive of the program, you're going to be okay and you're way ahead of the curve. The assistant coaches also encouraged to be in the room and they need to be supportive as well. They need to be supportive of the program. They need to push their players to you. Player evaluation will be provided whenever a coach asks, but at least at the midway point in the end of the offseason program. Specific information is always available. Communication about the needs is inherently important, especially with our guys, whether it's weight, whether it's strength issues, whether it's the position coach noticed a player limping only when they do a certain movement. Okay, well, let's sit down. Let's try to figure out what it was. It might be a trigger point. They need their psoas release. Something as simple as that can go a long way. <clears throat> neck training, it's a whole nother conversation, but train your athlete's neck. If they're in a combative sport, you have to train their neck. We use the nod, we use the tilt. We typically go through a four-way neck. Anytime we do the neck, which is at least twice a week, we'll go through a four-way sequence, and we'll add our nod and our tilt almost every time. There's some days we'll start with a nod, some days we'll work into a flexion, other days we'll start with a flexion, then work into the nod, or vice versa for the back, the extension, the tilt. So there's tons of ways. Look up neck training. Make sure you guys know how to provide manual resistance if you don't have neck machines. If you do, use the neck machines and coach them properly. Take your time. Emails right there. If you guys ever have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. There's a lot of information. I want to keep it basic. If you have more specific questions, reach out. Anytime I'm available, if you guys ever need anything, don't hesitate. Reach out to me or anyone else in this room. These are all great guys to learn from. I've learned from everyone in this room. Thank you for the time, guys. I appreciate it. Thank you.